Okay, will you guys turn with your Bibles um, to Isaiah chapter 40? Brad, do you want to add anything? Cheryl? No? You guys good? Okay. So we, we mentioned that the goal of coming together and why we're doing church is to seek the Lord and to bullhole him rightly. That, that's something that if you've been attending for a certain amount of time, you've heard me say that many, many, many times. Yeah? Um, today, I, I want to clarify and even add on to that statement. Um, and so it caused me this week to ask this question. What does the clearing look like at its best? Like asking that question, what do we look like at our best? Is it a building full of seats, like every single row, every single seat is full, and there's just a line out the door because everybody just wants to be at church? That's great, but I don't know that that's us at our best. Um, is, it, is it the abundance of resources for all the people that are coming, and everybody's just, you know, everybody's giving, everybody's receiving from the Lord, and there's just blessing upon blessing upon blessing? I think that's good, in a, but I don't know that that's the clearing at its very best? Is it gaining millions of followers and having a super strong following on YouTube and Instagram and all the social media things and we're reaching the nations? I think that's good, but I don't know that that's us at our best. Um, is it, is it uh, doing everything with excellence and having everything, all of our ducks in a row and never having a construction zone anywhere in our building? Apparently not. <laughs> it's definitely not that because we've been doing that for like forever, for two years. Um, it's, it's, no, I, I think that the clearing at its best looks something different. Um, those are all really good things, but I think there's, I think there's a better goal for us to search out. Um, if I could tell you guys a story, uh, it was Christmas of last year, 2022. No, two years ago. Uh, and we're having Christmas. It's the day after Christmas. So if any of you guys have like little kids, the day after Christmas is literally just a war zone because there's Legos and Barbie high heels and just pieces of every thing that you gave your children are now is just absolute shrapnel. And it's just like, there's GI Joe heads on Barbie heads. And you're like, what is going on? <laughs> what's going on. And, and it's just toys everywhere. And you're stepping over stuff and it's just like picture it in our house. It's chaos. Um, so it's the day after Christmas. And uh, in order to try to clean up the house, we're like, hey, kids, like you need to go into your rooms. You need to clean, get your laundry, take it downstairs. Um, and what we do every year is we do like lots and lots of candy in our stocking. So we give each kid like a big old stocking and Lydia always fills it with like insane amounts of candy, but then we give each other um, stockings with lots and lots of candy. And Scarlett, she's like going downstairs, she's got a laundry basket, she's going down the steps to her laundry room, and then she kind of disappears. I'm upstairs in the kitchen, just chilling, uh, you know, doing, drinking coffee, I think, just chilling, and all of a sudden she comes back upstairs, and she, she walks up around the corner like this. She's, and she's walking back to her room and I'm sitting there like, what's going on here? <laughs> like, it's kind of a weird way to walk with a laundry basket up this high. Um, and, and I noticed behind the laundry basket, her mouth is like this. And she's walking, chipmunking like a million different chocolates in her mouth. So what she did is she walked downstairs and she went into Lydia's, uh, Lydia's little nightstand and she found like all of Lydia's Dove chocolates that I just got. And she just started pounding them. Like, I'm gonna, chip, I'm gonna chipmunk these and bring them back to my stash. I don't know if her plan was to just like bleh and just like <laughs> then save them for later or... But she's thinking, I'm going to get, this is how I'm going to get past dad. I'm going to fill my mouth full of chipmunk food. I'm going to walk by him. He, there's no way he's going to notice. This looks so natural. <laughs> right? So she's like this. And I'm like, hey, Scarlett, where are you doing? And she goes. <laughs> and it was very much like, if you've ever seen The Grinch, 
where like he he messes up his face shaving and stuff and they're like hey can you remove the bag from your head and he like removes the bag but then his foot's up in front of his his face and then he moves his his one foot and his other foot's still there and you're like come on buddy what's going on and so she lowers the basket i'm like what's in your mouth scarlet she goes chocolate <laughs> and i'm like whose chocolate is that and she goes <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Scarlett, so you did two things wrong here. One, you really need to get better at looking more natural. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm like, one, Scarlett, you tried to deceive us by holding this thing up and covering what you actually did. And then two, you shouldn't have stolen what rightly belonged to your mom. So she gets disciplined and, you know, we're, we're obviously not, we're like upset with her and it's like, man, what in the world? But Lydia and I both talk and we're like, oh my gosh, that is what we look like when we hide things from God. When he like catches us red handed and we're, he's like, hey, bud. And we're like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I was totally natural, you know, and and that's what that's what we look like. We're we're just like we're holding on to things that he's like. I've told you, like you know this. That's why you're that. Like sometimes the Holy Spirit comes to us. He's like, hey, you know, you're not supposed to be doing what you're doing, and we're like, yeah, I know, but you know, and we're holding on to things, and he's just he's just not there for it. And I realized, like over my life, the amount of times that I was just living my life pretending to be one way, like, but yet I'm just walking around with my, my laundry basket. Like where I'm like, I'm going to church, but if everybody knew what was actually happening behind the scenes, they wouldn't like it, right? Where I'm, I'm playing the game, I'm like, yes, Lord, I give you all my affection. I give you all of everything in me. I just love you. You're worthy of it all, but you're not worthy of what I'm looking at on Instagram, you're not worthy of what I'm searching on my phone. You're not worthy of what I'm walking, watching on Netflix because that's for me, right? You're chipmunking. That's going to be the new thing. You get caught in sin. People are like, bro, you're chipmunking. <laughs> you're trying to stash something away, but I see it, right? And, and there's a problem with this because like over time, I remember like, I'm struggling with sin, like really struggling with like lust and, and stuff like that. And, and people preach and they'd be like, oh, you're a new creation. Like you're a new creation. Yeah, all things of old have passed away, but all things are new. And I'm like, why do I feel so old? I don't feel new because I'm, I'm still carrying laundry baskets around. Um, and it's true. You have been created new. All things have passed away. They've all gone, but guess what? You're still left with the same habits and desires you still had before you came to Jesus. But here's the thing. When all things have passed away and the new has come, that means new habits and desires need to come too. You tracking with me here? And so I like, I struggled like walking my life and just feeling like, man, Jesus made you perfect. And I'm like, I don't feel perfect. Like, I wanted to be like a follower of Christ who walked like without, you know, without the stuff in the way. And like people be like, oh, how are you, brother? I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm doing so good, man. Man, God is good all the time. Right? And we just look so unnatural. Like, it is so obvious when you're not doing good. Can I just say that? Like, as a pastor, it's obvious when you're not well. Because <laughs> a lot of us are like walking around like, yeah, bro, God is so good, man. Why? Because I've done it too. Like, I have done it too, where it's just so obvious. Like, we are, we are contradicting ourselves. And here's the, here's the thing that I, I think that I'm coming to realize is that Walking with Jesus, it's about walking in connection, not your contradictions. That like, I think the world is really tired of Christianity and tired of the church because we have a whole lot of contradictions and not Christ followers. 
And I'm not like this. Please understand, like, I'm not being mean because I, I want you to understand, like, I've been there. I've been the guy who's like, yeah, don't do, don't sin. We shouldn't be doing these things. And then, like, behind the scenes, I was doing those things. And it took my wife catching me to get me out of those things. Can we just, man, we're gonna, you, I'm going to make you uncomfortable, okay? With, I'm just going to be vulnerable and real because if I'm not vulnerable and real, you're not going to get free. Is that okay? Like, we need to be a people that are connected to Jesus and not just walking around with laundry baskets pretending we don't have laundry. Yeah? So, Mark, John Mark Comer, says this. He says, knowing something is not the same as doing something, which is still not the same as wanting to do something. You see that? Knowing something is not the same as doing something, which is still not the same as wanting to do something. Some of us, like we, we come to church and this was me, like I came to church and I'm thinking like, if I can get enough understanding, it'll make me not want to do these things. But this is what, here's the reality. I can teach you and I can preach to you. I can give you the word upon the word upon the word. And I can give you head knowledge on head knowledge. But guess what? It's not, can you keep that up there, Elliot, that quote? It's not the same as doing it. It's not the same as walking it out. And it's still not the same as wanting to walk it out. Knowing something is not the same as doing it. So you can come to church and you can know about Christ, but is that the same as desiring Christ? What's better? Man, you guys are quiet. Can you guys like interact with me a little bit more today? Like, yeah, come on. Like, it's not the same. It's not the same as like, it, it, yeah, I, lo I love Jesus. But it's like, but do you actively love him? Do you spend your time with him? Do you talk to him? It's not the same just to say, oh yeah, I walked into a building, said I love you a couple of times, then I moved on and then I just didn't say anything to him again. That's not the same. Knowing something is not the same as doing something, which is still not the same as wanting to do something, which means we need new desires, okay? It's not enough to just change your knowledge. You need new desires. You need knowledge that produces new desires that makes you want to do something with those things. Does that make sense? Yep. This transformed my life, guys. Like I, it, the, I saw this quote and I was like, oh my gosh, that is what happened in my heart. Like I followed Jesus long enough that that had knowledge moved into my heart and then it created new desires in me. And then I didn't even go back to sin because my desires were taking me away from it. I was so addicted to Jesus, I couldn't be addicted to other things. But nobody taught me that. I just had to follow Jesus into it. Come on, but I'm glad I'm teaching it to you because man, I wish I would have had this. I wish I would have had a pastor that was really vulnerable and honest about, man, sometimes your desires are just contrary and sometimes we need to do something to change our desires. So here we're going to go to Isaiah. What does this have to do with the clearing at its best? We're going to find out here in Isaiah. So in Isaiah, it's the writings of, about Israel and Judah where they were beginning to be surrounded by their enemy, enemies, largely because of the dis disobedience of the people of Israel. Their whole nation starting to get surrounded by all these other nations. And it's because they were disobedient. They started to follow other idols and things like that. The first 39 chapters of the book Isaiah, of Isaiah is largely about punishment. It's about discipline. It's about the, the, the repercussions of what it means when you don't follow God. Okay? But there's a transition right here on Isaiah 40. There's a transition. This whole book goes from punishment to promise right here where you're open. Everybody have your Bibles open? Right there. This is the part in the Bible where we start to hear of a one of someone coming, of a man coming, a promised one who's coming. So check this out. This is, this is the theme song and uh, the theme uh, slogan for our church. And I, I just want to flesh this out with you. Chapter 40, it's the glad message that Yahweh will come to man and clear the way for him to return to the promise. So Isaiah 43 through 5, it says this. 
A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. And uneven ground shall become level. And the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In the end of that verse, sorry, I'm reading in the ESB. Let me read in the NLT. Listen, it's the voice of something. Shout, someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make straight a highway through the wastelands for our God. Fill in the valleys, level the mountains and hills, straighten the curves, smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and the people will see it. The Lord has spoken. This is actually a picture. I've always read this the wrong way. I've always read this like, we, it's, it's John, that's John. He's about to clear the way for the Lord. This is the, you know, we're about to read it here in a minute, but this is about God, like people coming and clearing the way for God. And actually this verse is not about man clearing the way for God. This is about God clearing the way for God. I had never known that before until I got into it this week and got into like the commentaries and the different Greek and or, or the different Hebrew words here. It, it's about God clearing the way for God. It's about making straight highways through wastelands, filling in valleys, leveling mountains and hills, straightening the curves, smoothing out rough places. Why do we do these things to roads? Come on. Why do we do it? It's easier. It's more efficient. It's faster, right? It's easier to get somewhere if you're going in a straight line, not a, anybody ever gone to like California in the mountains that, what was that one highway? 101. And it, oh my gosh, you're just like, like it's so, it's just nothing but windy things that you're just turning and turning and turning and turning. And what literally would probably take one or two hours takes four hours because you're turning constantly. God's not interested in getting you tomorrow. He wants you now. So he provided something and someone, and his name is Jesus. So here's the deal. With clearing the way, God's clearing the way for you first. Like he's doing something to clear, to clear the way for you first. In Isaiah 49, go to this, nine chapters forward. 49, 8 through 12, it says, Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. And this is the Lord speaking to us. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to um, apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out to those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways. On all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst. Neither scorching wind or nor, uh, nor sun shall strike them, for he who has pity on them will lead them, and by the springs of water he will guide them. So if God takes you anywhere, he's going to give you food and water all the way. If he's taking you anywhere, he will give you everything you need all the way. Watch this in verse 11. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up, Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Syene. What's God saying? He's saying, I'm going to make it as easy as possible to make myself accessible to you. What he's saying is, Zion, the place where the Lord dwells, we're going to make every avenue possible as easy as possible so that my people can come and be with me. So God clears the way. Okay. How in Proverbs 3 6, he says this. Check this out. Proverbs 3 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. How do we acknowledge him? We refuse to let the laundry baskets get in the way. How can I acknowledge you? If I'm looking through a laundry basket, come on. Like some of us come into church, we're like, oh, I just want to encounter God. How can you when there's something in the way between you and the accessibility that he's provided? Like he paved a clear path and then we start throwing laundry baskets in the middle of it. That's sin. 
Sin is not bad because it's bad. It's bad because it gets in the way of what we're trying to behold. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what did they do? They hid behind a tree, and that tree became what blocked them from seeing the man who came to walk in the cool of the day to see them. Right? And we just like carrying laundry baskets around. If our acknowledgement of God helps God make our path straight, how do we make sure our ways, our habits, desires, and thought processes acknowledge God? Yeah, let me say it one more time. If our acknowledgement of God helps him make our path straight, how do we make sure our ways acknowledge God. Can you put that verse back up, Elliot? You know what? Just leave them up until I'm, <laughs> until I'm on to the next one. In all your ways, acknowledge him. So that means in my ways, I have some sort of a responsibility here that I actually have to acknowledge him in my ways. And then he, what does he do in return? He makes my path straight. He makes it easy to connect with him. What does this have to do with the clearing at its best? We're going to find out right here. Go to Luke 3, 2 through 6. This is about, the, about John the Baptist here. Are you guys good? Yeah. You staying with me here? Come on, we're on a journey. Like we're about to get to the end. It's going to be so good. Luke 3, 2 through 6. During the high priesthood of Ananias and Sapphira, the word, everybody say the word. No, I'll say it louder. The word. the word. Thank you. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, the crooked shall be straight, and the rough place shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see, everybody say see, see. the salvation of God. So it says John is in the wilderness, and who comes to him? The Word. Georgina spoke a few weeks ago about who the Word is. And it, who is it? It's Jesus. This, here's the deal. Jesus himself didn't come to John. It's the spirit of Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the word made flesh. John's in the wilderness. I'd like to propose to you that the Holy Spirit came to John and said, hey, guess what? I'm clearing the way for you. The, G, the son of God, Jesus is coming. Now you are going to prepare the way for him. And what does it say at the end of the verse? All flesh shall see the salvation of God. It's really, really hard to see when we are holding laundry baskets. It's hard to see God when he says, hey, I set you free from that, and we don't want to let go of what we're carrying. So we're like, oh, I just don't feel connected to God. I know I worship. I read my Bible. Uh, and what's in our hands? Right? We're holding dirty laundry. We're holding on to stuff that's like, why? And, and we're gonna start, we're, I'm gonna talk about it here. Okay. Again, I am not talking about shame. I'm not talking about condemnation. You need to understand this was me. Like we're talking me right now. This is so constant in the body of Christ where we hear about the goodness of Jesus. He prepared the way. And then we realize there's actually a responsibility for us to clear the way to not let anything to obstruct seeing salvation, the person of Jesus. So by grace, Jesus clears the way to provide us accessibility. Now we, through the guidance and pruning of the Holy Spirit, we clear the way to keep that accessibility unobstructed from the things that aren't found in the life of Jesus, like laundry baskets. Nothing can stop God from loving you but lots of things can stop you from loving God. Can I say it one more time? Nothing can stop him from loving you, but lots of things can stop you from loving him. So let's answer the question. What does the clearing look like at its best? 
the clearing is at its best when we collectively behold Jesus and become like him. It's not enough just to behold him. We have to become like him. Come on, it's not enough to come to church on a Sunday morning and just be like, okay, cool, I did the Christian thing. No, you have to become like the Christian thing. You have to become like the Christ. What does the, what does the word Christian mean? It means little Christ. Like you, you're meant to look like him in the earth. And, and, and for too long, there's been too much of both. There's been too much of like followers who are not actually following you are at your best when you behold Jesus and become like Jesus. Another way to say it is the clearing or you, you're at your best when the collect or the clearing is at its best when the collective trajectory of all of our desires and preferences are pointed at the person of Jesus. Can I say that one more time? The clearing is at its best when we collectively when the collective trajectory of all of our desires and preferences are pointed at the person of Jesus. We're all aiming at something. But like as a group, as a, per, as a tribe, as a, a community, what are we aiming at? And if we say we're aiming at Jesus, then we ought to look like him. Come on. You guys gotta get, get, wake up. I'll, I'll hit the espresso button at the back of here. Then free espresso on the... <laughs> If we say we come to church because we love the person of Jesus, why do we not look like him? Clearing the way for Jesus in our lives is unto the guarding of the connection that we have with him. For the world to encounter a people that are walking in connection, not contradiction. So now we have a problem, right? Because I just presented a whole problem. You're like, yay, the clearing's at its best. Woo! But now we have a problem. The problem is the contradiction in the, in the room. The problem is when our hearts are contradicting the one we say we love. Clearing the way is to contradict the way of the world, not to contradict the one we follow. We have too many followers who are contradicting the one they follow. If Jesus says the best way is this way, and yet our lives are walking this way, you're not actually following. You're contradicting. Come on, guys. I'm not being mean. I'm not, I'm not upset with you. Nobody's mad. Like, can we easy up? Like, it, but we have, at some point, we got to just like look at it for the way it is. If we say, I am a Christian, the problem is in the West, we say Christian, and that can mean many different things. Like that can mean I go to church or I believe in a concept of God or I believe in the concept of Christ. I believe in, uh, uh, the, I'm an evangelical or I'm Protestant. Like, it, like there's different ways we, we look at the word Christian. But I'm telling you, Christian boils down to, are you following Jesus? And if your ways are not like his ways, then you're contradicting him. You're not contradicting the world. And here's the deal. You're always contradicting something. Your life is always contradicting something. If you're walking with Jesus, you're going to be contradicting the world. That means you're not living for my truth because he is the truth. That my truth actually died and I'm not living for my truth anymore. It's his truth. I let go of what I believe to be true to follow the truth. Dude, that was better than you. <laughs> you understand? Like, that means that like, when I, when I decided to follow the pure one, I had to walk away from lust and walk in purity. And that every moment when I walked back into lust was actually contradicting him. This is like a brain surgeon. Like if you're a neurosurgeon, to be a neurosurgeon, you have to go through a one-year fellowship. Anybody kind of familiar with this idea? You have to actually apprentice underneath of another neurosurgeon. So that neurosurgeon, you, you're gonna, you guys are gonna come into an OR, you're gonna be doing brain surgery together. He's gonna be teaching you, this is what we do, this is how we do it, this is how we come in, this is how we go out, this is how we put everything together. But here's the deal, if you go into surgery with your mentor, the one who taught you how to do this, 
and you start making incision on toes, you're like, yeah, we're gonna enter through the toe, we're gonna travel all the way up through the body, up to the brain to do brain surgery. Everyone in the room's gonna go, who in the world did you do a fellowship under? Who taught you that? That doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't you just go through the head? Are you understanding me? And, and what, is, what does that reflect on? It doesn't, ref, it, it, it reflects poorly on you and it reflects poorly on him. And many of us don't want to look at it that way. I'm not being mean. Can we just be super, super honest and vulnerable today? I, too long I spent my life just walking like, oh, whatever I do, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He forgave me. Grace saved me. It did. But Hebrews actually says, strive to enter into rest. Strive to enter into rest so that you do not walk into disobedience. So you're like, Ethan, this isn't the first finished work of God. This isn't grace. This isn't mercy. No, it actually is. It is. You're like, this sounds like works, not freedom. No, it's not. He made it completely free. And guess what? It's time to drop the laundry baskets and move on. But here's the deal. When we act in sin, when we do something contrary to his way, it doesn't reflect just poorly on you. It reflects poorly on him. Where if that brain surgeon had a mentor, a mentee, and that, uh, that uh, apprentice is doing surgery on a toe, they would go, that guy needs to get stripped of his license too. Because he must have taught him that. And, he, and he's over here going, no, I didn't actually teach him that. I didn't teach her that. But everybody in the world's going, well, you seem crazy. You seem crazy. You seem just backwards. Not It doesn't make sense. And what we do is we paint a false image of who he is because we're contradicting who he is. And I'm telling you, the clearing at its best, it's not contradicting him. It's connection to him. You at your best... It's not you just doing the Christian thing. You at your best is you following him. In every way that you find that is not his way, letting him take it from you. John Mark Comer, he says this. I've just been loving John Mark Comer, so you're getting a lot of quotes from him. He says, our strongest desires are not the same as our deepest desires. Our strongest desires are not the same as our deepest desires. What does that mean? I walked my whole life just battling just, the, just a lustful desire. Like from the time I was really, really young. And I remember my dad, like I was a, a teenager. My dad was like, hey, are you struggling with this? Are you struggling with like pornography? Are you struggling with this? I would be, I'd be like... No, dad, I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm good, dad. And I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. It's too awkward. It's too painful. It's too weird. I don't want to look, I don't want to look weak. I don't want to look like I don't have it together. I, I'm fine. But he knew I was chipmunk and stuff, right? He knew. And th this whole quote, this idea that your strongest desires are not the same as your deepest desires. We have these strong desires, what, just being honest, like strong desires to like, to go after lust, to go after substances, to lie, to gossip, to get yours, you know, strong desires. Ever been tempted before where you just feel like you can't get away from it? Like it is so strong. Okay, just me. Yeah. Apparently, I'm the only fallen one <laughs> who has fallen short of the glory of God, right? Strong desires, they're just so like, you don't even know what to do with it. Guess what? There's other desires. There's deeper desires. What are those deeper desires? The deeper desires are the things of God. It's who are you going to be? Like, who do I want to be as a father and as a husband? Like, what kind of promise and purpose do I want for my life? Like Jesus called you, he knitted you in your mother's womb and he says, I have a plan and a purpose for you. 
Those are the deepest desires in you and me where we go, no, I don't want to just be a drug addict. I don't want to just be an alcoholic. I don't want to be abusive. I don't want to be a gossiper. I don't want to be a selfish jerk. I, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be selfless. Like I want to be a good father, a good husband who's faithful. Dude, I know I'm talking. Come on, guys. That's your deepest desires. And at some point in your Christian walk with the people in this room that are like, I am free by the blood of Jesus. What happened? The blood of Jesus came in and he started to root out new desires in you. And those deep desires started to take over the strong desires. Or when the strong desires came, we said, no, that sounds a lot like my way and I have a different way. Jesus is the way. That sounds, like, that sounds like death, not life. I'm just not gonna be a part of that anymore. I don't actually hunger and thirst for that anymore. You know why? Because I found bread and I found wine over here. Come on. Okay, so 1 John 3, one through three. Here it is. We're gonna get free today, guys. Like we're gonna talk about how we get free. I know it's 12, we're landing. Here we go. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Watch this. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we, what we know, but what we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So when we see him, we become like him. Here's my challenge to you. It's not enough to just come to church and be, oh, yay, I, I beholded him. You need to see him, not through the cracks of a laundry basket, not through the cracks of your sin, not through the cracks of your habits and old desires. Like you need to see him. And if you see him, if you clear the way for him as he has cleared the way for you, if you clear out some of those bad habits, those bad desires, that sin that's stealing from you and not giving you anything, if you clear that out, you get to see him. And guess what happens when you see him? You become like him. Jesus isn't something to know. He's a person to behold. He's a person to know and become like. John Mark Comer, again, he, that previous co quote, that's going to make more sense now. Knowing something is not the same as doing something, which is still not the same as wanting to do something. So it's not just enough to know. It has to get deep into your desires. It has to get deep into the desires that contradict Christ, that you go... No, that's actually contrary to my deepest desires. Come on, you guys are making, this making sense? Like, it's like your strong desires, all those, that just sick, yucky stuff that like is trying to lure you away, it helps to just put a name on it and go, oh, you're a strong desire, but you're not the deepest desires that I have. The deepest desires in me, that's what's guiding me. That desire for lust, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pursue Jesus. Like, I'm actually going to reshape my desires. Will you guys stand with me? A new creation reality is the beauty of a new existence that still requires new depths of desires and habits that have yet not been formed. Salvation is the process of Jesus saving you from contradicting desires in order to protect the clear way for better, higher desires. So we are truly at our best when we behold him rightly and when we become like him. I know for the last two years, it's been behold him rightly, behold him rightly, behold him rightly. That's step one. Step two, become like him. Don't be in the world and be looking like the world. Like be in the world and be Jesus in the world. The only way we become like him is if we behold him. And the only way we behold him is if we stop carrying laundry baskets around. We can't just be a people that behold the risen king without also becoming like him in his risen state. He's calling us higher. 
So how do we get new desires? This is, this is the hard one. And this is the part where you come into church and you're like, yeah, I want to be fed knowledge. But now we actually have to take that knowledge and want to do it. <laughs> yeah? Like it's different, right? It's like you can't, there's going to be people and there's going to be soil in this room where that seed gets cast onto it and maybe 25% of you walk away and actually do this. But I'm telling you, if all of you do this, it will change your life. You need to curate your heart. What's curate? What does that mean? If you're trying to be fit and you're trying to be healthy, you curate your grocery list. You go into the grocery store and you pick the healthiest foods with the most proteins and you're doing it for a purpose. You're curating your list. You're curating what you're feeding yourself, right? But if I go into the grocery store and I just pick out Ben and Jerry's as I always do, (laughs) and I'm just eating nothing but Ben and Jerry's, it's going to be contrary to actual what my physical goals are, right? Another way to, cu- to curate a list, right, is a, who has like Spotify or Apple Music lists. Like I have all these different playlists and they're all curated by me because I've picked, this one means this to me. Like, oh, I love this song. This is going here. This is in my Jesus time playlist. We're putting this here. Like, uh, it's going to be perfect. But after, if I have a Jesus time playlist, which is what I do, I have a time, like I go into my secret time with the Lord, boom, Jesus time playlist, let's go. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, you know, like all that music's on there. If I like put that, if I put it on there and then like all of a sudden I'm like, okay, it's Jesus time playlist. And then all of a sudden I hear, turn down for what? (laughs) Right? It's like, what in the world is that doing there? (laughs) Right? You're like, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense in this context, Right? But I'm telling you, there's things in our hearts that we're feeding ourselves that are contrary to the playlist that we want for ourselves. Like what you want for yourselves, those deep desires, if you ask yourself, what do I want for my life? There's things you are probably feeding yourself that you actually don't want for your life. And you're adding things to the playlist that just shouldn't be there. And so we have to ask the question, What are we aiming our hearts at? Aim your heart at God, not at your iPhone. Aim your mind at Jesus, not at your shopping lists on Amazon. Aim your mind at Jesus, not your problems. What worldly things, when our minds and our hearts, like think about this, when when you slow down, there's no distractions, Where does your heart go? When your heart and your mind are on autopilot, where do they go? If we ask that question, like ask yourself that today. When my heart and my mind is on autopilot, where does it head to? Is it going to Netflix? Is it going to pornography? Is it going to alcohol? Is it going to drugs? Is it, where's it going? And if the state of your heart, when nobody's running it, when the hands are off the steering wheel, if it's drifting, that would say that there's a curation problem. So how do we fix these old desires? We take the songs that shouldn't be there and we replace them with what should be there. We take the entertainment that we've been feeding ourselves like Netflix and whatever. Like I'm not, we have Netflix in my home. We, I'm not like, but we, we are careful about what we're letting in. Like, I'm not against these things. It's fine if it's feeding you the right thing. But if it's feeding you the wrong thing, don't be surprised when you walk around with laundry basket and can't see right. We need the word. So if you're like, man, it just seems so hard to follow God, remove the things that are tempting you to not follow him. Remove the distractions and the stuff that are actually stealing from you. If you're on autopilot, And you're just like, okay, we're just going to go through Instagram right now. And oh, okay, now I'm down here. Now now I'm feeling anxious because I'm seeing all these problems in the world. And oh, that person's way more pretty than I am. So I, I, oh my gosh, and I'm feeling this way. What's that doing? Is that taking you closer to Jesus? Is that shaping your deepest desires? No, it's not. Like we need to tend to our hearts Too often, like, we care more about our shopping lists and we care more about our playlists 
than we do about the condition of our hearts. Like we're more worried about what we're going to eat for lunch than we are about what word we're going to get in us. And these aren't just like, we're not, I'm not trying to like, oh, yeah, let's have a couple drop the mic moments. Like I'm, this thing's for real guys. Like if your phone is leading you away from Jesus, destroy your phone, burn it. Like if your conversations are taking you away from Jesus, stop having conversations. It's it, like, we, we made it so complicated. And I'm like, I wish somebody would have told me back then. It's like, oh, there's two different desires in you. There's your strongest desires that are not who you are. It's instant gratification. It's, it's I want pleasure now. I want pleasure now. I want this now. Two day shipping. I want it now. Then there's the deepest desires that say, no, in the long run, who do I want to become? When I look at the person of Jesus, I want to become like him. So if I become like him, it's going to look like patience, long-suffering, joy, peace, kindness, self-control. Come on. You know what it doesn't look like? It doesn't look like ignoring people because you have an issue with them. It doesn't look like gossiping. What I'm telling you, we have Christians that contradict Christ. Like a madhouse in America right now. We have Christians who are more obsessed about making great America great again than they are about being great in the kingdom. Just being real. Okay? I know we're late. Now you're all looking at your phones. You are late. <laughs> okay, ask yourself this question this week to end. What do you look like at your best? What do you look like at your best? When your heart is on autopilot, where are you going? And if you find yourself going to things that represent instant gratification and not the deeper things that God has for you, and you'll know it, because instant gratification usually steals from you. It usually destroys. It hurts your connections with your family. You know it. You, no one needs to tell you. You know. But the deeper desires, the things that are worth correcting that autopilot to go, oh, I've got five minutes. Should I scroll on my phone or should I open up my book? Should I sit there for five minutes at my desk at work and just find another YouTube video? Or should I sit and just... Holy Spirit, thank you that you're here. Thank you that you love me. Help me to know you more. You're my deepest desire, not entertainment, not distractions. You're my deepest desire. Come on. Dude, Easter next week is going to be fire. You know why? Because I, I truly believe this. I think that people in this room, they're going to walk out these doors and the Christian life is not just going to be located in here. It's going to leave the room. And people are actually going to walk and they're going to go, man, I have deep desires that are worth following. The purpose and the promise that God created for me, it's on the other side of me shaping my desires. <laughs> what would it look like if we didn't contradict Christ? Oh my gosh. What would it look like? It would be absolute revival. It would be absolute like everyone in the city would be like, I don't know how to not love Jesus because of what I'm seeing. Like these people are crazy in such a good way. Cause my goodness, like, oh man, I know I keep going one last thing. We should be so clean internally and in our mind that we should be able to welcome people into our homes and they should be able to go through our homes and our phones and there should be nothing to be scared of. There should be nothing. We should have no concern of what could they find. Do you know, like on, online, I've seen YouTube videos, people are like, let me see your phone. I just want to look through it. And they're like, no, 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 no. Because we're all carrying, like, we're carrying laundry baskets. But what would your life look like if you were so clear in your mind that you could go, here, take my phone, I don't care. 
look, you're, no, you're just going to find Jesus. You're going to find Bible apps and notes about Jesus. And you're, you know what I mean? How awesome would that be? If somebody could go to just x-ray you and they're like, man, I just, I don't, I just see Jesus. That's what we need, man. Like we need that level of clear conscience. So Jesus, everyone, raise your hands. Lord, help us. Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus to us. Reveal the deeper things of Christ, the deeper desires. Help us not to just behold you, but to become like you, Jesus. Come on, say that if you need. Help me, help me. He's the helper, he's the comforter. That's what he does. He helps us become like Jesus. So Jesus, help us shape our desires to become like you, that our autopilot would always lead us back to you and not to the the things of this world. Amen, amen, amen.